Hello, history hatters. They reopened the trolley station beneath DuPont Circle. Or at least, that's what the papers said. Most of the entrances still remain locked as tight as when they were abandoned in 62. But there were signs of life. New coats of paint that read DuPont Underground. I continued my search for an entrance until I found one bustling on 19th Street. I opted to follow the crowd. After all, why shouldn't I take a look? Down we went into DuPont Underground. So it was true. After 55 years since the National Capital Planning Commission recommended this space be turned into a Rathskeller, a cabaret, someone finally did it. Good for them. I took a look around. Everyone was in good spirits. In the bliss of soaking in the tunnel's transformation, they'd forgotten this was the very site of the Trolley Terror of 57. I would like to tell you of an incident in which I was involved recently in your city in the hope that it will bring to the attention of the proper authorities a most deplorable traffic situation. On Saturday night around midnight, a friend and I were driving north on Connecticut Avenue on our way to Bethesda. We had heard that there was an underpass that could be taken to avoid DuPont Circle. A block or two before the circle, we approached an underpass and, thinking that it was the one about which we had been told, we entered it. It wasn't until we rounded a sharp curve that we realized that we were in an underpass that was meant only for trolley cars. We were unable to back out because of the sharp curve, so we drove around several more curves, finally able to pull off of the tracks onto a passenger platform just in time to avoid being hit by a trolley. We then had to turn around and go back out the way we had come, and once again narrowly missed being hit by a trolley car traveling in the other direction. When we finally got back out onto the street, we were both quite shaken up and realized that we had escaped injury only by the fact that the trolleys travel infrequently at that late hour. I want to say here that when we entered the tunnel, we saw no signs to indicate that it was for trolleys only, and there were no barriers to prevent automobiles from entering it. I have since learned that several other people have made the same mistake. In a city such as Washington, the nation's capital, where many strangers come and go daily, such a traffic hazard, I feel, is inexcusable. Virginia B. Holly, Towson, Maryland. Unfortunately for Miss Holly, she mustn't have been wise to the trolley tracks as she drove over them, like these, which can still be found laid into the ground in a few spots in Georgetown. After word of Miss Holly's adventure spread, the traffic director ordered reflectorized signs to read for streetcars only. The gesture was too little too late. Already fed up with accidents, both from vehicles and people striking trolley riders as they entered and exited, some people soured on the very idea of the trolley. The irony is, the DuPont trolley station was constructed to reroute trolleys from street level and remove them as a traffic hazard. Here's one of them running along Connecticut Avenue prior to the station's creation. Another gripe was Congress's insistence the trolleys be powered from beneath the tracks instead of overhead. Thus, all repairs had to be made underground. With Washington's icy winters and humid summers, trolleys were frequently stalled and could easily back up traffic. With the prospect of air-conditioned buses that weren't subject to the limitations of subterranean power, Washington soon phased out its entire trolley system by 1962. When they sealed off the tunnel entrances two years later, no one gave a hoot. The entire tunnel system beneath DuPont Circle, which runs some 75,000 square feet, was left to ruin. In 1993, the city granted a 20-year lease to a local developer, Gary Simon, who had several prior felony fraud convictions. The project, called DuPont Down Under, opened two years later, and the West Station's tracks were lined with fake trolley cars which served fast food. The project was fraught with setbacks, closed within a year, and plans to open a Washington sports club in the East Station never even began. The developer was sued by seven of his subtenants, and the city attempted to revoke his lease, but the lease ended up in bankruptcy proceedings, and it wasn't terminated until 2000. 
The space remained unused until architect Julian Hunt advanced a plan for a group of artists and architects called the Arts Coalition for DuPont Underground to acquire a lease for the space. In 2014, the coalition successfully gained a five-year lease from the city and the DuPont Underground was born. Over the past five years, the Underground played host to gatherings of every variety of visual, audio, and immersive arts. One thing is certain, kids couldn't chase each other on these tracks 60 years ago. The Underground is also home to colorful works from multiple generations of graffiti artists. From astronauts, to intricate geometric patterns, coral reefs, beautiful portraiture, and creepy people that float or walk with trees on their feet. It's all here in the Underground. The point is, the underground is rumbling with people once more, but its fate is up to you. Trust me, you don't want to wait another 55 years to enjoy it. Show your support by attending one of the many events advertised on the DuPont Underground website throughout the year. I would like to thank the staff of the DuPont Underground for extending the many courtesies to make this episode of the History Hat possible. Click on the History Hat logo to subscribe and continue to explore the mysteries of history.